Welcome to our second AbleCon session, Special Needs Trusts and Able Accounts. We're honored to be joined by board certified elder law attorney, Howard Crooks. Howard's practice is devoted to elder law and trust and estate matters, including representing seniors and people with special needs and their families in connection with asset prevention, preservation planning, supplemental needs trusts, Medicaid, Medicare, planning for disability, guardianship, wills, trust, and healthcare planning with advanced directives. Howard is certified as an elder law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation and currently serves as the chair of the Florida Bar Elder Law Section and the Board of Trustees of the National Academy for Elder Law Attorneys Foundation. Welcome, Howard. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And uh, do, if it's okay, would like to clarify that I am the immediate past chair. Now, <laughs> through the passage of time, I'm happy to report that I survived my year as chair of the Florida Bar Elder Law Section, and now I get to be the immediate past chair. <laughs> Wonderful. Happy to hear that. All right. Well, if you wouldn't mind, please take it away with your presentation. Thank you so much. So today we're going to be talking about special needs trusts and ABLE accounts. This is a very complex area of the law, but very important for people to understand, uh, particularly families of individuals who have disabilities and wish to provide for their caregiving and well-being through the use of special needs trusts and ABLE accounts. So with that, Let's take it away. I can advance the slide. Oh, remember to share screen. Ah, excuse me one second. Okay, is that showing up? Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay. My only problem is that it is not moving forward on my computer. So something is not working properly on my end. There we go. Okay. So with that being said, we're going to start out with special needs trusts, and we're going to cover a number of different topics. One of the things you're going to have to become familiar with is public benefits, and we're going to go over several different public benefit programs so that you are familiar with them. Then we're going to turn our attention to why special needs trusts are necessary and the different types of special needs trusts and some of the ins and outs and nuances of these trusts so that you can become familiar with which type of trust might be in the best interest of you and or your family. So from a government benefits standpoint, starting there, we want to talk about several different government benefit programs. And the distinction that we make here is between government benefit programs that are non-means tested and those which are means tested. The two most important programs that are not means tested and which are very impactful for individuals with special needs include Social Security Disability Insurance, otherwise known as SSDI, or Medicare. Typically, individuals will qualify for SSDI if they're unable to work, and so they have a disability that causes this condition, and as a result, if they have paid into the system, they, they used to work, then they suffered a debilitating event, and they are now disabled, those individuals may qualify for non-means-tested SSDI benefits. And they also may qualify for Medicare benefits to cover health insurance costs. The other two benefits that we'll talk about today are both means tested. They include Medicaid on the one hand or SSI known as supplemental security income on the other. For Medicaid, a person cannot have more than a certain amount of resources, and for some Medicaid programs, they cannot have more than a certain level of income. And for supplemental security income, 
the person similarly cannot have more than a certain amount of resources and or income. The difference between SSDI on the top of the slide and SSI on the bottom is that for SSDI, you had a work history in order to qualify, whereas for SSI, you need not have that work history. So the two programs, Medicaid and SSI, that are means tested are critically important because for those programs, if a loved one needs to qualify for these two programs, it is highly likely that a special needs trust will be necessary in order to qualify for the benefits. Whereas the two programs on the top of the slide, Social Security Disability Insurance or Medicare, are not means-based and a person can have more than the uh, minimal amount of assets allowed under Medicaid or SSI. So with that being said, let's move on to the next slide. A brief overview of Medicaid. Medicaid is a joint federal and state program. It is uh, out governed by rules that are published by the federal government and states implement them at the state level with some variation from state to state as to how the program is implemented in that particular state. And there's joint funding. So in every state, there's some federal funding and there's some state funding that supplement the federal dollars that are used to pay for this program. As I said, it's administered through a state or a county agency and the resource allowance that a person can have in order to qualify for this benefit is no more than $2,000. So not a lot of money. There are, um, these are federal minimum standards. States are allowed some flexibility in implementing their programs. For example, in Florida, the resource allowance is $2,000, but in New York, they have a waiver from that requirement and they're allowed to have up to about $30,000 in resources. You will also notice that the services that are offered are not the same from state to state. So it is very important if you're moving around, if you move from one state to another, Whatever services you are able to avail yourself of in Florida, when you move out of Florida, you may not be able to avail yourself of the same level of services. The only level of care that is not subject to state variations is nursing home coverage because this is a federal requirement that all states must cover nursing home care, but beyond that, you will find wide variation in the home and community-based services that each state will provide. Okay, so what are the different kinds of services? We've touched on a little bit by talking about skilled nursing facility services. That goes in the category of long-term care and custodial care. We talked a little bit about home care, home and community-based services. That might be an aide that you would have come into the home. It might be uh, a nurse that comes into the home, other types of specialized caregiving. It could also include going to a doctor, physician services, going to a hospital, going to adult daycare, and prescription drug costs. So there are a variety of different services that may be covered under Medicaid which is why it plays such a vital role in special needs planning. And so now we're just gonna go into some of the details of the SSI program, so you have a better understanding of that program. Remember, SSI is one of the two big programs that we discussed earlier, where assets and income are relevant to the determination of whether and to what extent you will qualify for SSI benefits. So as a starting point, we talk about the assets. You cannot have more than $2,000 in resources. Now, the reality is that the SSI program came about in around 1972, and the resource allowance has not been changed since then. That's pretty astonishing when you consider the impact of inflation since 1972. Back in 2014, there was a proposal to increase the resource allowance to $10,000 by um, Senator Warren and Sherrod Brown of Ohio, and that did not pass. 
Recently, in 2023, Sherrod Brown, again, along with Senator Bill Cassidy and the several others listed on your slide, have reproposed a $10,000 resource level. However, to date, there is no bill that has been enacted by Congress that would increase the resource allowance to $10,000. In addition, the SSI program is designed to cover food and shelter. It used to cover food, shelter, and clothing. Back in 2006, clothing was removed from the SSI benefit as a main purpose of why these checks were being issued to people who qualified, which meant that because it wasn't designed to cover clothing, if you spent any of the money uh, outside of food and shelter, then that would be a problem. So by removing clothing, it made it easier to simply have the money used for those two purposes, food and shelter. It still became a problem because $900 is about the average check that you can expect under the SSI program. That's not enough money to cover food and shelter as we all know. And so by restricting the use of the SSI check to food and shelter, it actually made it more difficult for somebody to survive. Starting on September 30th, 2024, Food will no longer, if you use uh, the, any of uh, uh, benefits for food, it will no longer cause a reduction in the SSI benefit. And thus, food provided by third parties will also not cause a reduction in the SSI benefit. So over time, we have seen the removal of both food and clothing that if provided in kind would have caused a reduction in the SSI benefit. And as of September 30th, 2024, both clothing, which has been removed since 2006, and food will also have been removed from causing a reduction in the in-kind benefit that is provided to an, um, a recipient of SSI benefits, which now means that when you get your SSI check, all of it is available to pay for your shelter expenses without any concern for reduction being caused by others providing to you clothing or food. So that is a positive benefit. In addition, you should know that there are two component parts of the SSI benefit, the largest being the federal, uh, federal amount, and then there's a state supplement that gets added to that. So that is a determination that each state makes, but it is uh, usually around $100 or so that gets added to the federal benefit, but that varies by state. So now, why would we need special needs trusts? Well, the reason why we need special needs trusts is because the benefits that a person gets from SSI or even SSDI is not sufficient to cover all of their needs. And in planning one's estate where there's a family that has an individual with disabilities, here are just some examples of items and expenses that a person may require over and above that which the SSI benefit can pay. And by funding a special needs trust, it recognizes that SSI and Medicaid will only go so far in covering all of the needs of an individual who is disabled and has all of the same and additional costs to a person who is not disabled. Shelter costs, food, clothing, recreation, transportation, all the expenses that we are all confronted with on a daily basis, and then some have to be met for this person who is disabled. And so what the special needs trust does is it supplements the care needs of an individual and covers expenses that the government benefits program simply is unable to cover because it's not a comprehensive benefit. So then the question that we have to address is, what happens if you have a person who has a disability, but they have assets and you cannot meet the asset test to qualify for SSI? There are any number of reasons why a person might have assets. Um, they could they include all of the items on your screen now. So a person may have already had assets before the onset of the disability, and now 
the question is, what can they do with these assets or must they spend them down before they can qualify for government benefits such as SSI or Medicaid? Persons who are disabled as a result of a personal injury may receive a personal injury settlement or award. This money will come into the hands of the person with a disability, thus disqualifying him or her from receiving SSI and or Medicaid. In addition, a family member who dies and leaves an inheritance to a person with a disability will cause the person with a disability to lose eligibility or not be able to qualify in the first place for government benefits. Then you have matrimonial settlements. So if there is a divorce and pursuant to the divorce, there is money paid to an individual with a disability that may cause the person to no, no longer be eligible for government benefits. And finally, if government benefits have been suspended for a protracted period of time, there are circumstances where a retroactive government benefits payment will cause the person to have more resources than the government benefit program allows. So what do we do? Well, here's what we don't do. If you have a disabled person who accepts the money, they can transfer the assets, I suppose, but it's not a great idea because transfers of assets create periods of ineligibility. These are periods of time during which the individual does not qualify for SSI or Medicaid. So you can't just have money or receive money and transfer it without a consequent imposition of a penalty period by the government benefits agency, whether it be the Social Security Administration on the one hand, or the Florida Department of Children and Families in the case of Medicaid. The other option for the individual is to simply spend down the assets. But if you do that, then you're spending the assets. And after the assets are fully spent down, you will not have received, you won't have any government benefits during the spending down process and then once the assets are spent down, you could qualify for government benefits. However, now you have no assets. You have no pool of money that you can reach to in order to cover all these additional expenses that we know are going to arise during your lifetime and which must be there to supplement the disabled person's care needs. So the best option is creating a special needs trust. It's also known as the exception trust. And the reason why is because it is an exception to the transfer of asset rules under SSI and Medicaid, and it also will not count as a resource for SSI or Medicaid. So when we talk about the $2,000 resource allowance, the money that's in a properly drafted special needs trust will not be counted as an asset, and the transfer of the assets into the trust itself will not result in the imposition of a penalty period or a disqualification period. So it serves both functions and it is incredibly powerful for that reason. So let's talk generally about exception trusts. Um, I just mentioned that they're disregarded as of either income or resources for Medicaid eligibility purposes. The trust assets are not considered owned by the individual who has a disability and who is wishing to apply for and receive government benefits. As we said, there's no penalty period upon the funding of the trusts. And it's really important to understand this last point on this slide so far, which is if you use a traditional trust that is not a special needs trust, and sometimes they're also called supplemental needs trusts, if you use a revocable trust or any other kind of a trust that's not specifically geared for a person with special needs, the great likelihood is that the assets in the more traditional trusts will count as an available resource. Therefore, you cannot just take any old trust and say, I'm going to put money into this trust and conclude that because it's not in the name of the person who's disabled, it won't be a countable asset. If it's in a traditional trust and the person with a disability is a named beneficiary of that trust and it doesn't have some really important language in the trust that makes it a special needs trust, you're gonna have an available resource issue 
and it's very difficult to get around, if not impossible. So that's why it's so important and why I'm going out of my way to make sure that everybody understands that only a special needs trust will properly protect the assets and the income from qualifying for government benefits. Now, let's get into the kinds of special needs trusts. There are essentially three kinds that we're going to discuss. First is called a first party special needs trust. What this means is that the beneficiary, him or herself, had money. And if you recall a few slides ago, we talked about the ways in which a special needs beneficiary might have his or her own money, right? That was the one where you might have had your own money before the onset of dis the disability. You might have received money if there was a personal injury award. Somebody might have left you an inheritance. And if you come to the table with your own money, you must set up what's called a first party special needs trust, which is to being it's the beneficiary's own funds. And that is to be distinguished from a third party special needs trust, which means somebody else's funds is being used to create the special needs trust. Who would be this third party? In most instances, it will be the parent, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a grandparent. It could be a brother or a sister. It could be any other relative. It could even be a friend. So anybody really can set up a third party special needs trust for the benefit of a person with a disability. And then you have the third kind of special needs trust called a pooled special needs trust where the assets of a uh, all of the disabled beneficiaries who have funds and wish to qualify for government benefits are pooled into the same special needs trust with sub accounts. Um, so it, all the assets are earmarked separately for each individual disabled beneficiary. And we're going to go into all three kinds of trusts in greater detail, but these are the three kinds we'll be discussing today. So the first party trust, I gave you the statutory citation, 139064 of the Social Security Act. This is a way to protect assets and income for individuals with disabilities and without sacrificing their government benefits. And specifically, we're most concerned about SSI and Medicaid, as you know. In order to have a valid self-settled special needs trust, this is a first party trust, it's gotta be in writing, got to be irrevocable, and it's got to be inter vivos, which is just a Latin term, which means created during one's lifetime. So there is no way to create a self-settled first party special needs trust through a last will and testament or through a revocable trust that takes effect upon death. It must be set up in writing, and it must be irrevocable, and it must be during the individual's lifetime. Okay. So other parameters we're concerned about when we talk about first party trusts. First, this trust must be created for the sole benefit of the individual with disabilities. It cannot be created for multiple parties. Only one person can be the beneficiary of a self-created um, self first party special needs trust. And that's it. You have more than one beneficiary, the Social Security Administration and or Medicaid will reject it as not being a valid first party special needs trust. The other really important thing to remember is that this type of trust, this type of special needs trust, must be set up when the individual is under age 65. And that's a really important uh, distinction. See, if you look in the slide, it says under age 65. That means if you are 65 or over, then you cannot validly set up a self-settled first party special needs trust. So that's the under age 65 requirement. In addition, it is very important for everyone, meaning all family members or anybody who might want to contribute to a special needs trust, that they don't make any contributions to the first party special needs trust. Why? The reason for that is just underneath that part of the slide. The reason is that there is a payback provision in first party special needs trusts. What is a payback provision? A payback provision is a provision in a first party trust that says when the disabled 
beneficiary dies, Medicaid must be paid back up to the amount of Medicaid benefits paid during the disabled beneficiary's lifetime. So if there's $50,000 left in the self-settled special needs trust, first party trust, and Medicaid has a bill for $75,000, that's how much in benefits they paid during the individual's lifetime, how much money will Medicaid be paid back from this trust? The answer is only $50,000 because the payback only applies to the money that remains in the trust when the individual dies. If the amount of the payback is less than the amount in the trust, then it is possible to direct the remaining assets to other individuals in the family. So using the same numbers, if there was $50,000 left in the trust, when the disabled beneficiary died, and there was only $25,000 worth of Medicaid benefits paid during the, during the individual's lifetime, then $25,000 gets paid back to Medicaid and the rest can go to other family members. So if a family has three kids and there's money remaining in this first party uh, trust and the disabled beneficiary wants to say, I got two siblings, I want them to share in any remaining funds when I die, then they can do that once Medicaid is paid back. A couple of uh, points to mention here that when a person dies, it acts as a lock on the funds in the trust until Medicaid payback occurs. That means that payment of funeral expenses cannot occur after the person's death. Thus, with a first party trust, it is extremely important for people to make provisions for funeral expenses during their lifetime and not leave it to relatives upon death if the only source of funds is are the funds contained in a first party special needs trust because the trustee will not be permitted to pay those expenses unless and until Medicaid gets paid back and determines that there's in fact money left over. That is a process, process that takes at least several months. So you don't wanna be in that position. In addition, if there are multiple states that have to be paid back because the individual has moved throughout his or her lifetime. You want to make sure that there's language in the trust that specifically addresses that issue because the Medicaid agency in each state will review the trust. And unless you have a provision that specifically says that if the person receives Medicaid for more than one state, there will be a pro rata allocation of the balance remaining upon death to each of the individual states in proportion to the amount of Medicaid benefits paid by that state, then the Medicaid agency in state two, state three, state four, they will reject the first party trust for failing to address the payback to multiple states. Very important. Okay, uh, as far as who can establish a first party trust, a little bit of history here. There was a time when the federal statute and the state statutes that correspond only allowed for a parent, a grandparent, a legal guardian, or a court to set up a first party trust. As a result of a statute that was passed in 2016, the Special Needs Trust Fairness Act, Individuals were then permitted to establish their own self-settled special needs trust, and that was added to the statute at both federal and state level. So now a fifth category of persons, which is the individual, him or herself, who owns the assets, can set up their own first party trust. And once you do, we know that the assets are not accountable. Distributions do not equivalent are not equivalent to income for benefits purposes. So if you're on SSI, a distribution out of the special needs trust will not cause a reduction in your SSI benefit. And as we discussed, there's no SSI or Medicaid penalty period. However, if you contribute assets to a self uh, a first party special needs trust after you turn 65, those transfers now are penalizable by both programs. So you don't want to do that. 
Uh, one thing to point out as far as payback provision, the reimbursement is only for Medicaid, not all public benefits, and specifically it doesn't include any benefits that are paid by the Social Security Administration. So that's in the favor of the disabled individual and his or her family. The reimbursement amount is based on only the actual Medicaid expenditures and Medicaid usually pays less than prevailing market costs. So that also is to the benefit of the disabled beneficiary. There's no interest charged on the Medicaid expenditures. So if these expenditures occurred 10, 20 years ago, you're not gonna be charged for the payback amount and interest on the payback amount, that will not happen. Um, and just remember that some services are not covered by Medicaid, so the reimbursement is not gonna cover any services that might've been paid for outside of Medicaid. Now, oftentimes, one of the most challenging issues we confront when it comes to first party trusts is who's gonna act as trustee. This is critically important because the trustee has to become familiar with highly complex rules and regulations pertaining to SSI benefits on the one hand, Medicaid on the other hand, and it's challenging at best. In addition, a trustee of a, a special needs trust is, is gonna be called upon to do things that are very, very different and above and beyond that which a trustee of a more traditional trust is called upon to do. Therefore, you must have somebody who not only is a trustworthy individual for the management of the assets, but also who knows the beneficiary who's disabled, who is an integral part of that individual's life, who really is acting at a, a genuine um, concern for the individual and really will do whatever they are called upon to make sure that the person who is disabled is being properly cared for at all times. And it is a, um, a challenging position. Certainly they can be paid for their the work that they're doing, um, but it does require a family to think about who is the right person to act as the trustee of a special needs trust. If you don't have the right person, um, the best I can say about that is it, it would really be a disaster and cause a lot of problems for the well being of the disabled beneficiary. So now we're going to move on to third party trusts. And the distinction here, primary distinction is that we're not dealing with funds of the disabled beneficiary. We're dealing with funds of somebody other than the special needs beneficiary, usually established by a family member or a friend. Now, this one, contrasting it with the first party trust, this one can be set up during lifetime or at death. And if it is at death, it would either be through a will or a revocable trust, with one exception. If you are trying to create a special needs trust for the benefit of a surviving spouse, you cannot use a trust in order to set up that spousal special needs trust. You must create the spousal special needs trust inside of a will. A last will and testament is the only way that you can create a spousal special needs trust, a special needs trust for the benefit of a surviving spouse. Anybody else, whether it's a child, a niece, a nephew, anybody, you then can also create the special needs trust, a third party special needs trust through a revocable living trust. So that's an important distinction for spousal SNTs. Now, when we draft these third party supplemental needs trusts, we have greater drafting flexibility because the rules are not as complex. And we also uh, can use outside investment advisors, which by the way, we can use those for self-settled special needs trusts. These are just easier animals to deal with, but they still do have the rules that have to be complied with as far as SSI and Medicaid and not running afoul of those rules. Uh, but there is no payback provision there's no issue when the person dies dealing with Medicaid, making sure that that gets paid. And there's no issue with paying funeral expenses out of a third party trust when a person dies, right? There's your no payback to Medicaid, both block cap and underline. So that's the huge distinction for a third party trust versus a self-settled trust. So when we're doing planning for families, what kinds of things should we consider if they're planning with and for a person who's disabled? 
some people say to me, well, why don't I just disinherit so-and-so? Well, that's not a very good option, is it? Because so-and-so is probably a child. You probably want to be able to provide for them. And by disinheriting them, not only are you treating them differently than your other kids, but you're also putting them at a disadvantage because they're on government benefits and now they have no way of supplementing their care needs. So not a good option to disinherit. What about making a gift to a child with disabilities? Just give them the money outright. Well, we know that that's not a good option because there are asset and income tests that apply to certain government benefits programs. And if you simply give the money when you die outright to a child with disabilities, you're going to jeopardize that individual's ongoing eligibility or ability to qualify for the first time for government benefits. Not a good plan. What about this one? It comes up quite a bit. What if you distributed the assets upon your desk to one of the disabled person's siblings and just said, son or daughter, take care of your sibling who has a disability, as you know, and I just want you to do all the right things with this money. Why is that not a good option? Several reasons. First of all, you have no way of knowing whether the sibling who receives this money will actually carry through on your instructions. And in fact, legally, they're not obligated to because you distributed this money outright to them directly upon your death and in your testamentary documents. Even if you put some offhanded language that suggested that you want this money to be used for the benefit of the sibling who has a disability, that's not binding unless you make it binding through the language that we use. So not a good idea to shoot it to the sibling with the hope that the sibling is going to take care of the person with, who is disabled, um, one of their brothers or sisters. The other thing that we have to take into account is that if you distribute outright to a sibling with money that really needs to be carved out for the benefit of a person with disabilities, is that any one of us are subject to life circumstances, whether it be fiscally irresponsible or divorce or getting sued and getting a, a creditor judgment against you, gambling, alcoholism, whatever it may be, that money is not protected for the benefit of the person who is disabled. Whereas if it is in a third party supplemental needs trust, there is a fiduciary duty owed by the person appointed to serve as the trustee. If that trustee is violating their fiduciary duties, they can be removed. And it is an infrastructure that best protects the person who's disabled and other family members so that we know that we are providing an infrastructure that best cares for the individual with the disability. Okay, so what do we want to do with our third party trusts? We want to improve their quality of life. We want to make sure that there's no language in the trust that says something like, I want this money to support or maintain the person who's disabled. That's general language that will run afoul of the supplemental needs trust rules and the government benefit program rules. And we should also bear in mind that there is no Medicaid recovery against the assets in this trust. So you definitely don't want to confuse these two kinds of trusts and throw a payback provision in a third party trust. And believe it or not, over the years, I have seen third party trusts that were drafted by persons who didn't specialize in this area. They thought a payback provision was required and they put it into a third party trust, which, as we know, does not require a payback. When you're doing a third party trust, remember that you have planning options. You can either do it at uh, death or you can do it during lifetime with the one exception for spousal SNTs being that you cannot do it in a revocable trust. You must do it through your will. Okay, so I think we went over all of this except I do want to mention in the second bullet point there, 
We talked about language that's not good, support and maintenance language, but what language is good? Language that shows that this trust was designed to supplement and not supplant or replace government benefits for which the individual is eligible. That's the kind of language you want to see. And when we draft in my firm, we say it several times throughout the document so that the intent is clear, that the trustee understands it, that the government agencies understand. This trust is simply designed to supplement and not replace government benefits. Now, in a third party trust, you can direct whatever principal remains at the death of the beneficiary to any individual. So here again, if you have three kids, you want to set up a third party trust for the life of the disabled beneficiary, go ahead and do that. And then upon the death of the disabled beneficiary, the remaining funds can go to your other two kids. They can even go to charities that you may designate or other relatives, whatever you like. Now, a third party trust, interestingly, is known to be um, available but yet it's not actually described in any federal statute. Some states like New York do have a third party special needs trust statute, and you can um, track the language in the statute and know that you'll have a valid special needs trust. Okay, we've gone over all these. All right, so now um, let's talk about the irrevocability of a third party trust. They actually can be revocable or irrevocable. If you recall in a self-settled trust, the first party trust, I said that had to be irrevocable. The third party trust can be revocable or irrevocable. And when we get to the pool trust, which is the, um, the D4C down at the bottom, you'll learn that that also must be irrevocable. So the only one that can be either or is the third party trust. So now we're going to talk about the pooled trusts. These types of trusts pool the resources of many disabled individuals, and it gives unto one trustee, which is usually a nonprofit organization, the ability to manage all of these sub accounts that are created by the individuals who are disabled. What it does is it establishes an efficient way to manage all the assets of persons who are disabled and who want to have a place where they can park their money and know that it's being properly managed by a trustee who is well-versed in the government benefit rules and regulations. And that's one of the reasons why some people choose a D4C or pooled trust over a first party trust. Remember the trustee discussion that we had where I said, it's very challenging to find a suitable trustee in a family situation. If you have one, great. But if you don't, you can always default to a pooled supplemental needs trust and get the same benefits but by having this nonprofit organization serve as the trustee, and as I said, they are well versed in the government benefits rules and regulations, and the disabled beneficiary, along with the family, is a beneficiary of that knowledge and expertise. This type of trust is established by the individual directly. Uh, you can certainly have provisions in a power of attorney that allow another person, the agent under the power of attorney, to set up the pool trust for the disabled individual. And like the, um, like the first party trust, the pooled supplemental needs trust must be for the sole benefit of the disabled individual. As we said, the assets are pooled for investment and management purposes. This lowers costs and reduces the fees that are charged um, typically uh, for managing assets. Now, here we talk about in a pooled trust, a modified payback provision. Some pool trusts, so you got to check, will have a provision in their contract, and it's called the joinder agreement, that allows them to keep the monies that are um, after the person dies in the pool trust. Other pool trusts will allow for the remaining money after payback to go to relatives. So you want to check and make sure what type of trusts are you dealing with when you deal with pool trusts. What does this particular pool trust trustee require in terms of any funds remaining? after Medicaid gets paid back. Okay, we said it must be irrevocable. Let me go back for a second. Um, let's talk about an issue that doesn't apply in Florida, but just to make you aware, in case you do have a, a disabled beneficiary in another state, sometimes full trusts that are funded for individuals who are 65 and over 
are penalized. Florida, they are not. The National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, that's the NALA acronym you see at the bottom bullet point, is working with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to try to work on a resolution that would allow all disabled individuals to fund a pooled supplemental needs trust, even if they are 65 and over. That is not true yet, and it is not true in every state. Therefore, you have to be careful if you're outside of Florida. As I said, in Florida, it's not an issue. You can fund a pooled supplemental needs trust if you are 65 and over without any concern that Medicaid will impose a penalty period on that transfer. Although several years ago, Medicaid threatened to do just that. The elder law bar um, in Florida fought back and opposed that proposed pro provision and was successful. Um, so it is an issue that could arise in Florida, but currently it is not an issue. And then we talk about evil accounts. ABLE accounts, it stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. Um, so that's where the ABLE acronym comes about. It is similar to um, other tax advantage savings accounts like 529 accounts um, and, and IRA accounts. Um, and it, it has been around since December of 2014 when President Obama uh, passed it into law. They didn't get started in Florida until July 1st of 2016. And they're so similar to Section 529 accounts, which are used for college planning purposes, that um, a new section of the Internal Revenue Code was created called Section 529A, which is your ABLE account rules and regulations. In Florida, each state has its own name for ABLE accounts. It's known as ABLE United in Florida, and it is administered by the Florida Prepaid College Board. Now, here's a very interesting change. It's about to take effect. So a person who wants to set up an ABLE account must become blind or disabled by a condition that began before his or her 26th birthday. However, this is changing to age 46 in 2026. So starting in 2026, as long as the disabling condition at its onset prior to a person's 46th birthday in 2026 and beyond, that will also be a person who qualifies to set up an ABLE account. Now, as far as limitations, first of all, ABLE accounts are not permitted to exceed $100,000 if you're on SSI. If you're on Medicaid, it's a much higher amount you can use the 529 maximum for contribution limits. In Florida, that's $418,000. So depending upon whether you are on SSI and Medicaid or just SSI or just Medicaid, the combination of those benefits will dictate how much you can have an Enable account. The bottom line is only if you're on only Medicaid, will you be able to go beyond the $100,000? If you're on SSI, then it's going to be limited to $100,000. <clears> okay. Now, who's the owner of the account? It is actually the designated beneficiary of the account, the eligible individual. They own the funds. The nice thing about ABLE accounts is the money in the ABLE account grows tax deferred. And withdrawals from the account when properly used for qualified disability expenses, which we'll go over in a moment, are also tax-free. You can only have one ABLE account. So this is very important. Sometimes people think it's okay to set up multiple ABLE accounts. You cannot. You must only have one ABLE account. So how does it work? Once you've established an ABLE account, Annual contributions are limited to what we call the annual gift tax exclusion amount. The annual gift tax exclusion amount is a number published by the IRS and which goes up generally with inflation. It used to be 15,000, then it was 16,000, 17,000. This year it's 18,000. So you cannot contribute more than $18,000 per person per year to their ABLE account. If you want to open an ABLE account, you can go to ableunited.com and there is a whole step-by-step uh, -step set of instructions for opening up the account. 
And as we know, it is exempt assets for both FSI and Medicaid. It would also be exempt for SNAP benefits or food assistance and other types of housing benefits. So it is a great way to park money without having to set up a special needs trust. So if you don't have enough money, that's one reason to do an ABLE account. But there's going to be another reason that we're going to talk about momentarily, which has to do with the restrictions on the use of money from a special needs trust for housing expenses if a person is on SSI. And we're going to go over the more expansive use of monies held in an ABLE account for housing expenses, which will indicate to you that there is a benefit to having sometimes both a special needs trust and an ABLE account because used in combination with each other, it gives you the maximum benefit available to the person who has a disability. So one of the things I like to talk about is when we draft our special needs trusts. And the reason why I like to talk about this is it really highlights for those of you out there and listening to this, how important it is to work with a specialist in the area of special needs planning to draft your special needs trusts. We put language in our trusts that specifically authorize the trustee to transfer assets from the trust to the beneficiary's ABLE account. And that is a permissible transfer under the SSI and Medicaid rules. And we wanna make sure that the trustee is both aware that they have the ability to transfer from the special needs trust to an ABLE account and encourage them to do that for the reasons that I just outlined, which is to say, that there are more expansive utilization of funds in an ABLE account for housing expenses than would otherwise be allowed from a special needs trust. Also, distributions from an ABLE account are not considered income for purposes of government benefits. And it doesn't matter whether the distributions are made for a qualified disability expense, that is unrelated to housing. It doesn't matter whether the distribution is made for a housing expense, and it doesn't even matter whether the distribution is made for a non-qualified expense. Distributions from an ABLE account are not counted as income uh, for purposes of government benefits, and that's a tremendous thing to know and to be able to take advantage of. Now, we talked a moment ago about qualified disability expenses. What are they? They are all listed on this slide. Education, housing uh, is, is bolded and basic living expenses are bolded because those are the two that are typically implicated when we're talking about SSI benefits. But there are so many other expenses that are considered qualified disability expenses and would allow for a distribution in a qualified way for the use of the money and which will be it done in a tax deferred way you can use it for all these different reasons. But the reason why housing and basic living expenses are highlighted is because those are special expenses that typically, if you use money on housing from a special needs trust, you're likely to suffer a reduction in the SSI benefit. And this is where the use of the ABLE account can really be helpful because all of the things that are no-nos for the use of funds from a special needs trust that are listed here, you will be able to use your ABLE account for these kinds of, of uh, expenses without running afoul of what are known as the in-kind support and maintenance rules under SSI, which means that if you have a special needs trust and an ABLE account, it would behoove the disabled individual and or family to move money into an ABLE account and then use those monies to pay otherwise prohibited expenses from the special needs trust, because then you won't suffer a reduction in the SSI benefits. So that is a tremendous benefit of using the ABLE accounts, and that is why it is not only acceptable, but appropriate to have both a special needs trust and a, an ABLE account. In addition, you now are familiar with the notion that ABLE accounts have a limit on how much money can be placed into the trust, whether it be an annual limit of $18,000 contributed or a maximum limit of $100,000 if you're on SSI and $418,000 if you are only on Medicaid. 
So if you have those limits and they serve to restrict the amount of money you can have in the ABLE account, that's why you also want to have the special needs trust, right? There are no limits on how much money you can put into the special needs trust. Uh, then you also want to have the ABLE account to take advantage of these much more permissive, permissive use of funds for housing expenses. And here's an example that I like to go through. We have Maya. She's disabled and she receives $800 a month from SSI. She got a personal injury award, and thus she has set up a self-settled first-party special needs trust, which should trigger in your mind there's a payback requirement on her death. She'd like to move to a more expensive apartment, and it costs $1,500 a month. So if her parents give her the additional money needed to move into the more expensive apartment, it would be considered unearned income, and she would lose her entire SSI benefit under these facts. And if her parents paid the rent directly to the landlord, it would be considered in-kind support and reduce her SSI benefit by only a third, which is better than losing the entire benefit if they gave her the money outright, which was the prior slide. But instead of doing either of those two things, they could contribute to an ABLE account, $18,000 per year, and the ABLE account funds used to pay Maya's rent would not cause any reduction in her SSI benefit. That is just amazing, um, that result. And that is why people should have an ABLE account for sure. Um, remember that the ABLE account funds are not countable resources. Uh, they can be used to pay household expenses that funds in a supplemental needs trust could not be used without reducing the person's SSI benefits. So they are a really great way to complement the supplemental needs trust and facilitate the payment of really important and essential housing expenses without causing a reduction in benefits. So with that, that is an introduction into special needs trusts and ABLE accounts. And at this point, I will entertain if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those questions. Yes, thank you so much, Howard. That was a wonderful presentation, definitely very in-depth. Uh, overview on special needs trusts. We always get a ton of questions on this topic, and we do have just about a minute to address uh, a few of them, um, but I'll remind all of our viewers that we'll be working behind the scenes to answer all of your questions um, following today's presentation. So let's uh, jump into some of the questions. Um, how does someone find an attorney that specializes in special needs planning to work with their family or their loved one? There are numerous resources that you can look for. I will give you three organizations that are um, really, really good at making these referrals. You can contact the Florida Bar Elder Law section. So if you Google the Florida Bar Elder Law section, Emily Young is the person there who uh, can direct you to a special needs planning attorney in the geographic location where you, where you are. There's also the Academy of Florida Elder Law Attorneys that you can Google and get in touch with uh, Jennifer Dooley at the Academy of Florida Elder Law Attorneys and similarly get a referral to a special needs planning attorney in your geographic location. And then I'm also gonna mention the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, which we referred to earlier, that is the national organization. So if you are not in the state of Florida and you want a special needs planning attorney, any one of those three organizations may be of use to you. Wonderful. Um, another question, can you set up multiple special needs trusts for one individual? You may set up multiple special needs trusts for one individual. Uh, the facts and circumstances will dictate whether and uh, answer the question why you would do that. On the one hand, if you have multiple individuals and they have certain parameters they want to put in their trusts, for example, if parents have set up a third party trust for the benefit of one of their kids who's disabled and other relatives want to also confer a benefit on this disabled uh, child, but after the disabled child dies, they all have different ways that they want the assets to go. So the parents who set it up might want it to go to the other children in the same family. But if other third parties set, want to set it up and they have their own kids that they want to receive after the disabled person dies, then maybe we would do separate trusts. Otherwise, 
if we don't have different beneficiaries after the disabled person dies, it, it could be more streamlined if we only had one trust and everybody contributed to the same trucks. So we really want to dive into and consider all the different facts and circumstances as to why we would want to set up multiple trusts, but in appropriate circumstances, you absolutely can. Wonderful. Um, and in that same vein, how often should a trust be updated? So generally speaking, in estate planning, we recommend reviewing documents every one to two, two to three years thereabouts. It'll either be on that time frame or within that schedule or anytime there's a life event or a significant change that causes the need to amend the trust or modify one of its provisions, then that would be another triggering event for looking at the trust and possibly updating it. And by the way, this speaks to another thing which we didn't touch on earlier, which is even though the trusts are irrevocable, um, in some cases you can put in provisions that allow for it to be amended nonetheless. And it's very important to have that ability. Otherwise, if you need to go and amend a trust that's otherwise irrevocable, you may be forced to go into court in order to get that amendment approved by a court of competent jurisdiction which is a much more difficult thing to do than if you have language in the trust that allows for the amendment of the trust by a third party. Right, that makes sense. Well, that's all the time that we have today for questions. Thank you so much again, Howard. If we didn't get to your question, we'll be working over the next few weeks to get back to everyone. Uh, please remember that we are recording all of these sessions and we'll have a full playlist available on our YouTube page in the next week or so. Uh, and with that, we'll take another five minute break before our next session. Thank you.